our Bibles at this time to 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 1 for our message from the Word of God this morning. That'll be on page 1280 if you're using the Pew Bible this morning. This morning being June 4th, 2017, Picnic Sunday here at Faith Bible Church. And that will explain to our viewing audience why the pastor is dressed down a little bit this morning. Our text will be in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. And the title of this morning's message is Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And since this is Picnic Sunday, I'd like to begin by having a little fun with the words of an interesting country love song that my sister Judy sent me this past week. It's called, If My Nose Were Running Money. If My Nose Were Running Money. And here's just a few of the lines. You say that I don't love you. You say my love's untrue. Well, darling, if I was a rich man, I'd prove my love to you. I'd buy you a diamond ring and a new fur coat or two. If my nose was running money, I'd blow it all on you. (laughs) I'd buy you a Cadillac and a new Mercedes too. I'd build you that mansion up on the mountaintop if my nose was running money. But it's snot. (laughs) And finally, if my nose were running money, we'd be rolling in the green. But it's a booger of a problem because, honey, it's snot. I'll give you my sister's email address if you'd like to write and complain. (laughs) Well, our subject this morning is not love songs. But, Paul's epistles have been called love letters from God. And, since the love of a father for his son is so strong that makes Paul's epistle to his son in the faith, Timothy, kind of a a manly love letter. The kind of love letter in which you'd expect to find the words we read in the opening verse of our text in 2 Timothy 2 and verse 1, where I direct your attention at this time. The Apostle Paul says to young Pastor Timothy, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Now the first thing I want you to notice about that verse is it starts with a therefore. The reason Paul's telling Timothy to be strong is because of what he told him just a few verses ago in your first cross-reference in 2 Timothy 1.15. Remember when he said, All they which are in Asia... Be turned away from me. 
It was because so many people had turned away from the Apostle Paul and the message that he preached that he tells Timothy to be strong in the face of that apostasy so that Timothy didn't find himself turning away as well. Now, if you're wondering what it means to be strong in grace, I think the best way to explain that is to compare another time when the Bible uses that phrase, be strong. Look what Moses told Joshua in Deuteronomy 11 and verse 8. Be strong, he told Joshua, and go in and possess the promised land. Conquer those Canaanites whither ye go to possess it. Now, here it helps to remember that Joshua was to Moses what Timothy was to Paul. Joshua was going to carry on the Lord's work once Moses was gone, right? just as Timothy was going to carry on the Lord's work once Paul was gone. So, it's not surprising to see both those leaders, Moses and Paul, telling these young men to be strong. But, here it also helps to remember that Joshua was under the law, wasn't he? And Timothy was under grace. So, as we read on in your next reference, we don't see Moses telling Joshua to be strong in grace, do we? In the rest of Deuteronomy 11.8, it says, Moses said to Joshua, Therefore keep all the commandments which I command you this day, that ye may be strong and go in and conquer the Canaanites and possess the land whither ye go to possess it. Folks, the source of Joshua's strength wasn't grace. The source of his strength was the law. Under the law, God told Israel, if you're good, I'll bless you, right? And one of the blessings that He promised them was that they would easily be able to conquer the people living in their land. Look at your next reference. Leviticus 26, 3-7. He said to the people of Israel, God did, if ye walk in My statutes and keep My commandments, ye shall chase your enemies and they shall fall before you by the sword. That's why Moses told Joshua to be strong in the law. Thank you, Thornton. Because if, if Joshua kept the law, God would conquer the Canaanites, his enemies, for him. And you know that's what happened, right? When Israel kept the law, the walls of Jericho came tumbling down, right? But what happened when that guy named Achan sinned? When he sinned, a little teeny little town like Ai defeated the people of Israel. No wonder Moses told Joshua, be strong in the law. But Paul doesn't tell Timothy to be strong in the law, does he? You know why? Because God has not promised to conquer our enemies if we obey Him. We're not in the business of conquering our enemies in the dispensation of grace, are we? As you know, those Canaanites in the land had to be exterminated because as we saw in our scripture reading in Genesis 6 this morning, they were the seed of the fallen angels 
who married the daughters of men and created that demonic race of giants. God disposed of that first crop of giants with the flood. Wiped them out. But after Satan whipped up another batch, after the flood, God challenged Joshua to wipe them out with the sword. That's why God says these peculiar things like what we read in your next reference in Deuteronomy 20 in verse 16 where He commanded the Jews of the cities of these people which the Lord thy God doth give thee for an inheritance thou shalt save alive nothing that breathes Thou shalt utterly destroy them. And do you know what that means, folks? That included women and children and babies. And listen, you got to be strong in the law to obey a command like that. Amen. You have to really believe God when He said that those people need to be wiped out just as thoroughly as God wiped them out with the flood. People criticize the Bible all the time. Say, oh, it's no better than the Koran. It preaches death to the infidels, death to the unbelievers. And they quote these verses, leave alive nothing that breatheth. But they're not rightly dividing the word of truth, are they? <coughs> Folks, the giants are gone. God says in your next reference in Amos 2.9, Yet destroyed I the Amorite before them, whose height was like the height of the cedars. And he was strong as the oaks. But God says, Yet I destroyed his fruit from above, and his roots from below. That's God's phraseology to sh that means He gave Israel the strength to wipe them out. And that demonic seed no longer walks among us, folks. That's why we're not charged to be strong in the law in order to be able to kill God's enemies. We're told to be strong in grace so we can save God's enemies. Amen. That's why Paul says be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. What did the grace that is in Christ Jesus do to an enemy named Saul of Tarsus? Kill him? Conquer him? Exterminate him? No! Speaking of himself, back in his days when he was Saul of Tarsus, Paul says in 1 Timothy 1, 13 and 14, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor, but, but the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant in Christ Jesus. That's the grace that is in Christ Jesus. That's the kind that saves God's enemies instead of killing them. And that's the grace Paul's telling Timothy to be strong in. Do you know what God says about conquering enemies in the dispensation of grace in your next reference in Romans 8, 36 and 37? For thy sake we are killed all the day long. We're accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through Him that loved us. Beloved, under grace, God does not promise that you're going to conquer His enemies. God says it's way more likely they're going to conquer you. They're going to kill you all day long and count you as sleep, sleep. Sheep for the slaughter. But if you can give them the Gospel and they get saved, you're more than a conqueror. You did more than conquer Him. He said, how does that work? Well, listen. The Lord could have conquered Saul of Tarsus on Damascus Road that day, couldn't He have? Fire from heaven wiped him out. Do you know what He would have gotten out of that? 
All he would have got out of that was a dead enemy. When instead he saved him. Instead of destroying him, he more than conquered him. He won his heart. He gained an apostle to proclaim his grace to the world. And that's the grace we're called on to be strong in as well. I don't know if the Quran says to slay infidels. Some people say it does. Some say it doesn't. I don't know and I don't care. Maybe their book has to be rightly divided too. Did you ever think about that? I know this. If they're not smart enough to know that all slaying their enemies would do is give them a lot of dead enemies. <laughs> well, then let them carry out that their great commission, if that's what they think their great commission is. Let us do what Paul tells us to do and be strong in grace. Listen, you have to be strong in grace to send missionaries to Muslim countries where Christians are being killed all the day long and being counted as sheep for the slaughter. And yet that's what Things to Come Mission is doing. And if things get bad in this country and they start killing us, it's what we're called on to do, folks. Not join some militia group and oppose the government. Keep preaching grace. That's hard. And being strong in grace means more than just offering salvation by grace to unbelievers. Being strong in grace also means offering grace to believers as well. For Timothy, in this context, it, mean, it meant offering grace to all in Asia who departed from Paul and him and the, and the message they preached. I don't have to tell you, when it happens, it's easy to be bitter against those who depart from us and depart from the faith. It's hard to be strong in grace when that happens, and it happens. And it's easy to be bitter against those who depart from you personally. It, it hurts, doesn't it? it? happened to me not long ago. It's hard to be strong in grace toward people like that. It's what we're called on to be. And there's other areas of grace we have to be strong in. Timothy was kind of on the sickly side. But what, what do we read in your next reference in 1 Timothy 5 and verse 23? He says, Paul writes to Timothy, talks to him about your stomach's sake and your awful infirmities. Well, you know what? If you're sickly like Timothy, you've got oft infirmities. It's easy to spend your life just begging God to take it away. It's hard to read what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 12, 7-9. He said, There was given to me a thorn in the flesh, and for this thing I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. And what he say? He said to me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in your weakness. Oh, I don't have to tell you, it's, it's hard to believe God when He says, My grace is sufficient for thee when you're laying on a bed of affliction. You've got to be strong in grace to believe that. And there's another kind of grace we need to be strong in. The Apostle Jude talked about certain men in Jude 1.4 who were turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness. Beloved, once you learn you're not under law, you're under grace, it's easy to conclude you can live in sin and God doesn't care. It's harder to be strong in the kind of grace that Paul talked to Titus about in Titus 2, verses 11 and 12 where he talked about the grace of God 
And it's appeared to all men teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present evil world. You know what? I hope as you read your Bible through every year, you do read your Bible through every year, don't you? Amen. I hope as you read your Bible through every year and you look in that Old Testament and you read how God used to tell the Jews under the law to stone a stubborn, a stubborn son to death. To stone people who commit adultery to death. I hope you'll remember that God still feels the same about sin. He hasn't mellowed over the years. He hasn't just gotten used to sin. His anger still burns white hot against the tiniest infraction. He's just choosing to react to those infractions with grace. I hope you'll remember that and let that grace teach you to deny ungodliness and not presume on His grace. Listen, don't be like the Jews who used to presume on His grace. Under the law, you know how they found grace under the law? With animal sacrifices. But look what God had to tell them about their sacrifices in Jeremiah 7, 9 and 10. He got tired of them sinning and bringing sacrifices. He says, will you steal, murder, and commit adultery and swear falsely? And then, you got the nerve to come and stand before me in this house, my temple, which is called by my name and say... We are delivered to do all these abominations. The Jews had fallen into this bad habit, folks. They thought, well, I can just, when I sin, oh, I, I can bring a sacrifice and keep on sinning. They thought God gave them this animal sacrifice system so that the blood of those animals could deliver them to keep on doing those abominations. They'd sin and think, oh, oh, well, yeah, the sacrifice, the blood of the sacrifice covers it. Is that how you think about the blood of Christ? Oh, I sinned, uh, the blood of Christ covered it. Oh, folks, Jesus Christ didn't die to deliver you to do those abominations. Galatians 1 and verses 3 and 4 says, Christ gave Himself for our sins that He might deliver us from this present evil world. That's the kind of deliverance you want. Not deliverance to sin, deliverance from sin. That's why He gave Himself for us. Do you know how God fixed their thinking under the law? He told them what they could do with their sacrifices, quite frankly. Look at Jeremiah 7, 22 and 23. He said, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Put your burnt offerings under your sacrifices and eat flesh. I don't want to tell you what He's telling you to do, tell them what to do with those sacrifices, but you can imagine... And then he tells them why. He says, For I spake not to your fathers, nor commanded them in the day I brought them out of the land of Egypt concerning burnt offerings or sacrifices. This thing commanded I them, saying, Obey my voice. He reminded them that his original thought for them was to obey him. The sacrifice system was just an afterthought. God added it after He saw, well, they can't keep the commandments, so I better do something for them. He added it as a safety net in case they fell into sin. And they were using the safety net of animal sacrifices as a hammock to lounge in sin at the expense of the blood of those animals. But folks, we dare not use the blood of Christ as a hammock to lounge in sin. We dare not presume on the grace that saved us. We need to do what Paul told Timothy and be strong in the grace 
that is in Christ Jesus. Let that grace teach us to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts and live soberly and righteously and godly in this present age. And now I'm going to quit preaching and go to Medlin. There's another kind of grace we need to be strong in and kind Paul talks about in 2 Corinthians 8 verses 1 to 7. Remember when he talked, he said, Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, how their deep poverty abounded to the riches of their liberality, praying us with much entreaty, begging us we would receive their gift. And after telling the the Corinthians about those churches in Macedonia, Paul says, see that ye abound in this grace also. He's talking about the grace of giving. Grace believers know we're not under the law, so we don't have to tithe. So, so Paul calls our giving grace. We're not tithing, we're gracing. But that means you have to decide how much you're going to put in that offering box. It's hard to be strong in the grace of giving. James and I were talking about that yesterday because you don't know what's coming around the next financial corner. I told you when Obamacare kicked in and my premiums went up to $19,000 a year, I about fell out of my chair. I said, are they out of their minds? <laughs> and now Jesse's going to UIC in Chicago, University of Illinois. You know how much that I'm not going to tell you how much that costs. <laughs> Being strong in the grace of giving is hard. But it's what we're called to be. And if you think it's hard to be strong in grace, then God says that we have to tell other people, other believers to be strong in grace. And you know that because in verse 2 in your Bible now, that's what Paul told Timothy to do. He said, the things you've heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Well, one of the things Timothy just heard of Paul is to be strong in the grace that's in Christ, right? And listen, it's one thing to be strong in grace yourself in all those areas we talked about. It's a whole other thing to tell someone lying in a hospital bed racked with pain or dying of some incurable illness tell him or her be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus His grace is sufficient for you and I thank God that most of the time I've had to do that I've had to do it for grace believers who knew that God's grace is sufficient for thee like when I go to see Paul in the hospital. But I'm telling you, the time to learn to be strong in grace is now. Not before you're lying on... Before, I should say, you're lying on that bed of affliction. Not after. Before they start killing you all the day long and counting you as sheep for the slaughter. That's the time to learn how to be strong in grace. Now here, I have to mention something about verse 2 here. A few years ago, I got a letter from a Catholic apologist. That's a, a Catholic theologian who knew a little Bible. <laughs> and he used this verse to say, oh, you can't just go by what's written in the Bible. Because Paul told Timothy to pass on the things that he heard of Paul, not just what he wrote to him in his epistles. So this apologist argued, he said, well, we need to pass on oral traditions to faithful men to teach others the, the oral traditions too, as well as the Bible. You know, like the ones that Rome teaches. The ones that they say are equal in authority to your Bible. Another verse he used was your next reference. What Paul said in 2 Thessalonians 2.15 Therefore, brethren, <clears throat> stand fast 
Hold the traditions which ye have been taught, watch now, whether by word or our epistle. <laughs> oh, well, wait a minute. That verse certainly looks like he has a point, doesn't it? That verse looks like the oral traditions are as needed as Paul's epistles, doesn't it? Whether you heard it in word or in, in my epistles. Hold those traditions. Well, before we address that verse, let me say something about the, the danger of tradition because I grew up in that church. Look at a tradition that was popular in the Lord's day in your next reference. Remember when Peter asked the Lord how, how John would die in John, in John 21, 21 to 23? Jesus said to him, If I will that he tarry till I come, what's that to you? Then went this saying abroad among the brethren. A, a rumor got started. The story got started being told that that disciple should not die. And then John says, but Jesus said not unto him he shall not die. He said, if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? You know what you got there? You have an oral tradition that dates back to Jesus Christ himself. And that's important, that's significant because Rome says, well, our traditions, they date back to the early church. Well, folks, it don't get any earlier than that. <laughs> that one goes back to Jesus Christ Himself. And it was wrong! Years ago, I heard a good illustration of the danger of tradition. I don't think I've told it in the last nine years, so... Let's see if you remember it if, if you were here. They put five monkeys in a cage. Apes. With a banana hanging from the ceiling. And stairs right underneath the banana. Well, it didn't take them very long. One of the monkeys spotted it and starts climbing up the stairs to get the banana. Before he got there, they sprayed all five apes with water. Something that apparently monkeys don't like. And they kept doing that any time any one of them tried to go up the stairs to get the banana. Well, eventually, any time one of them would climb up, the other monkeys would beat him. <laughs> they didn't want to get wet. So eventually, all five of them just gave up trying, walking around the cage all day with a banana hanging there. Then they replaced one of the monkeys with a new one. Well, of course, he spotted the banana. He starts going up the stairs. They start beating on him. Every time he tried to go up there, they beat on him. So he learned not to even try. Then they replaced another one and another one until eventually all five of them were replaced. And do you know none of them ever climbed the stairs to try to get the banana. Even though none of them knew why they shouldn't climb the stairs because none of them had ever been sprayed with water. They were just enforcing a tradition passed on to them by the apes who came before them without knowing why they were enforcing it. Kind of like some of Rome's traditions. I don't know if you know this or not, but priests used to be able to get married. you know that? But at some point, the church realized, hmm, priests won't need as much money to support themselves if they don't have a family to support. That'll save us a lot of money. And the tradition of celibacy was born. I'm told that the tradition of not eating meat on Fridays was born when a certain pope had a brother-in-law in the fishing business. <laughs> maybe that's true, maybe it's not. We don't know! But that's the point. You can't be sure of the origin of any tradition outside of the Word of God. But you can be sure that all that's in the Bible comes from God. 
And if you want to know how serious God takes this, look at what Peter wrote in 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19. He said, For as much as you know, you are not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your sins. Is that what yours says? No. You weren't redeemed from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but you were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ. You know what that's saying? That's not talking about being redeemed from your sins. It's talking about being redeemed from your traditions. Men need to be redeemed from their religious oral traditions just as much as they need to be redeemed from their sins. You say, Pastor, what about that Thessalonian verse that says, Obey Paul's traditions, whether received by word or epistle. Well, look at another verse that that Catholic apologist used in 2 Timothy 3, verses 14 and 15. He said to Timothy, Continue thou in the things that thou hast learned and been assured of, and that from a child you known the Holy Scriptures. So the apologist said, see, he's being told to Listen to the Scriptures and separately the things that he had learned and been assured of. <laughs> Looks like they got you until you finish the verse. The fuller version in 2 Timothy 3.14 says, Continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and been assured of, knowing of whom you've learned them. Timothy knew that the traditions he learned were from the Apostle Paul, which means they came from God. The only way any of us can be sure that a tradition is from Paul, is from God, is if we find it in the Word of God. Do you, do you ever play that game where you put 20 people in a circle and whisper a sentence, a whole sentence to one of them, and then goes around the circle, gets back to you, and that sentence sounds nothing like that sentence you told in, in 20 people? Well, I got a question for you. If you commit an oral tradition to faithful men and tell them to teach others also, how far down the line do you think you got to get before that tradition you gave sounds nothing like what you gave? The thing that Paul's telling, the things Paul's telling Timothy to commit to faithful men are the things he preached that became part of the Word of God. And you know the Word of God never changes. You can always go back and say, that's what it says. Now here I have to pause and say something about that word commit when he says the same commit thou to faithful men. How many of you ever heard of that old fable of the chicken and the pig who wanted to do something nice for their farmer? So the chicken suggested they make him a ham and egg breakfast. And she concluded by saying, I'll contribute the eggs. And the pig said, well, uh, that's easy for you to say. You're making a contribution. I'm making a commitment. <laughs> that's an old... They call it a business fable. It must illustrate some business principle. But listen, the word commit is used 170 times in your Bible, and you know me, I read them all. And that's the way, that's the way that word commit is used in the Bible, in that kind of serious context. Anytime it's not talking about committing a sin, that's what most of the 170 are about. Anytime it's not talking about committing a sin, it's talking about a serious commitment. Speaking of Joseph's master in Genesis 39, 4-8, Joseph found grace in his master's sight. His master made him oversee over his house. And Joseph said he has what? Committed all that he has to my hand. Well, now let me ask you, did his master make a contribution to Joseph or a commitment? That's a commitment! I'll give you everything! Look what the psalmist said in Psalm 31.5. He prayed, Unto thy hand I commit my very spirit! 
to the psalmist make a contribution or a commitment to God? That's a serious commitment. Your eternal soul and spirit. And then look what Peter said about the Lord in 1 Peter 2, 21-23. Christ, when He suffered, He threatened not, but committed Himself to God who judges righteously. Did Jesus Christ make a contribution or a commitment when He took your sins upon Him and allowed God the Father to judge Him? Heaven made Ruby cry? Yeah, what do you know? Well, listen, if Paul uses that same word, commit, to tell Timothy to commit the grace message to other men, I have to assume it is just as serious a matter. Now, I also want to say something about that word faithful because... Sometimes I think Christians think they can't serve God because they read too much into that verse. They think they can't measure up to what that word faithful implies, so they don't even want to try. They don't want to get involved in any kind of ministry. But, you know what? I got to thinking about that, and I actually did more than that. I looked up all the times in the Bible the word faithful is used. And that word faithful, look, look what God said to Moses in Hebrews 3.5. Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant. Now, when I read that, I, I thought to myself, wait a minute. Didn't Moses kill a guy and then run from God for 40 years? And how about what God says about Sarah in your last reference? Through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age. Why? Because she judged him faithful who had promised. Well, wait a minute. When God told Sarah she was going to have a baby in her 90s, didn't she laugh? Sure she did. But as you can see there, later she judged him faithful who promised. And as you know, Moses did too. My point is this. Being faithful, folks, doesn't mean being perfect. Maybe you're here this morning and you haven't been running from God for 40 years, but you've strayed. And you're wondering if God could ever count you faithful. <laughs> well, Moses set the bar pretty low, didn't he? Faithfulness does not mean you'll never fall. Faithful, mean, faithful means you'll never quit. And if you think you can do that, say amen. amen. But if you're not saved this morning, I'd like to ask you the question that James Sermons asked the panhandler last night outside the Sears Tower. We're coming out of the building and some guy came up, gave him a song and dance and was looking for a handout. James didn't miss a, James didn't miss a beat. He said... He said, well, let me ask you a question. If you died tonight, are you sure you'd go to heaven? Let me ask you that question this morning. Are you sure you'd go to heaven if you died tonight? The man James talked to said, I, no, I'm going to hell. Because of all the things I've done. If that's you this morning, I can tell you on the authority of the Word of God, that the payment Jesus Christ made for your sins is more than enough to pay for whatever you've done in your past or whatever you're ever going to do in your future. And if you'll just believe that, God will save you. Amen? Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank You for this challenge from Your Word. 
this challenge to be strong in the thing that this dispensation is all about. It's the dispensation of grace. And we know it's hard when the rubber meets the road. We know it's hard to apply your grace when things get tough. But that's why Paul told Timothy, be strong in the grace that's in Christ. That's why he told him to tell others, be strong in the grace that's in Christ. May we take that to heart today. And then on this special Sunday, this picnic Sunday, I do pray that you'll bless the food that we're about to partake of and the warm fellowship we have can have around it. And I pray that you'll send our visitors home to Florida with rejoicing in their hearts because they were able to spend time with what we take for granted every Sunday. A people who know you and love you and know your word rightly divided and are willing to stand for it. These things we ask in Christ's name. Amen.